Well, I've been working at the studio since I was about 15. So I remember doing the first time I came up here was 1988, and it was still A&M Records at the time. You know, it was a historical lot. You know, it was the Charlie Chaplin lot where he lived and made all those films, you know, forever ago. And then uh, I forget what year A&M moved in here. Probably sometime in the 70s, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was the A&M lot forever and ever. And, uh, and I started, I came up and when I was 15 and did a, did a session here, it was a really big deal, coming to a real recording studio up here in Hollywood. I grew up an hour south of here. Uh, and over the years, I've worked here more and more often. And you know, the, the three rooms, they have to do drums here. All three of the rooms are great rooms, you know. And Studio B, this room is, is historical. And I've made so many albums in here. I was thinking about it last night when I was driving home. I couldn't even really name them all, really, like, because it, it, it all of a sudden turns into a blur for me as well, you know? But uh, aside from all the rooms being great here, and this room in particular, because, you know, A's a little bit larger, I think D's uh, shaped a little bit different uh, than this one, but this room in particular, I love that it's a controlled sound. It's not, obviously there, there's high ceilings, but it's not so giant and cavernous that it's a, uh, it's a punchy room. It's a punchy room, you know, and I've done some great, great recordings in here. Uh, it's special for me to still come up to. Henson bought this studio, I don't know, probably about 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. And when when a and moved out and became a part of Universal and Interscope over on the west side of town, I know every musician and producer in Los Angeles was all, everyone started to panic that they were gonna rip this studio out when they heard that A&M was leaving and that Jim Henson company was taking it over. Like, oh my God, what's gonna to happen to the recording studio? You know, because it's been a favorite for so many people for so long. And thank God they kept it intact, you know? Uh, a couple things have changed, but it's basically the same, you know? And uh, like I said, countless musicians, including myself, were all relieved when we realized it wasn't gonna be torn down like a lot of great things end up, you know, eventually in time, you know, <laughs> change around. You hate to see that change, especially a place that's classic and great like this. So, uh, yeah, I still, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, you know, rooms in town, you know, Los Angeles, there's so many studios, there's so many places to go. It's not like we live in the middle of nowhere and there's one great recording studio. There's a bunch of great recording studios in Los Angeles, you know. This just happens to be probably my favorite. Got to have the room, got to have the good room, which we have. And then, you know, there's a bunch of components, you know, but it really comes down to obviously, you know, the kit, the mics, the board, the engineer. And, uh, you know, when, when, when those things are all aligned and when, when you know you're, you have all those components that, that fit properly, it's, it's chances are it's going to be good. <laughs> You know what I mean? And uh, I've heard nice drum sets and nice rooms not sound good because you've got the wrong guy hitting them or you've got the wrong guy behind the board. But when, like I said, when all those uh, factors are in place and all uh, kind of uh, making sense, then you'd have a pretty tough time not getting a good drum sound. <laughs> Yeah, this particular uh, DW kit is a Collector Series drum kit. This one I've had about, God, I don't know, three or four years. And uh, I tour a lot with it. And I make a lot of records with it. I have a bunch of drums in storage. And it gets to a point when you've played as long as I've played and I've acquired drum sets over the years. Is like, you know, a lot of them end up collecting dust. There's special ones that you like to use you know, that, that, that are in the rotation a little more frequently than others, you know. This particular kit I really like. I think it sounds great. I think it looks cool, more importantly. <laughs> yeah, it's a simple, like, kind of gun metal gray. They, they look like metal drums, but they're not. They're wood drums. That's just the finish. Um, yeah, they sound great. They sound great everywhere I take them, you know? And so, like, especially when we, you know, spoke about doing these sessions here for Spitfire, I thought, yeah, what drums should I use? You know, because I got a bunch of great sounding drums. So, I'm like, why don't I use the most up-to-date recent ones that I'm using a lot right now. You know, they're not vintage, they're not antique, you know, it's just like, they're about four years old, but they, they sound fantastic, you know? And I feel comfortable playing them. Well, 
I think it's great when, when used properly, obviously, just like anything, you know, someone could not know what they're doing with it and make a mess of things. And, and uh, if you've got uh, the, the right components like we were speaking, of, speaking earlier, uh, it can really enhance, you know, and really help, especially if it's someone that's uh, needing the extra help, you know, as far as we're talking about, you know, maybe the, the younger person that doesn't have a budget to uh, hire me or hire Roger Taylor or, you know, or never going to meet Roger Taylor, you know, but the fact that you can go get his, his samples of him hitting his drums and playing grooves and whatnot and be able to kind of make your own, sculpt your own, uh, picture with it, you know, is, is fantastic. I've been asked to do things like this in the past, and I've always kind of, uh, it's never felt quite right, you know? And I've said no for years, and to, to a couple of fairly big companies, and, uh, and when Charlie Clauser contacted me, I don't know, probably about a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, uh, and, and we, we spoke about it, just it made so much sense. And I did the research and you guys had just done uh, the Lagrange with, uh, with Roger and Chad. And, and uh, it really is such a quality product and quality company that I, I didn't even have to think twice about it. I was like, this is what I've been waiting to do. There's a reason why I haven't done these other things with these other companies over the years. I've kind of held out, so to speak, you know. So happy to be here and happy to be doing it. You know, just being able to uh, work together the way we have has been very smooth and uh, fun and easy in the way of, uh, you know, just being patient and, and, you know, we're starting with, you know, most drums and cymbals, you know, starting from the, from the very quietest, lowest velocity and just hitting them up and up and up and up, you know, to the point where we're at our, our, our loudest, you know, and then bringing it back down and it's, it's been interesting for me because I've done sampling before in a studio where at the end of a session they'll say, give us a couple of hits of each drum. But it's literally, they just want boom, back, doom, doom. They don't want all the nuances and all that stuff. And that's what's been, I think, most interesting and fun for me is capturing all the, 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 the every last nuance of each drum and each cymbal for that matter too. Well, I, you know, we would put up uh, different click tracks at different BPMs and, uh, you know, obviously, like we spoke about before doing them, you don't want to just come right out the gate playing fills everywhere because after two, four bars, people are going to go, oh my God, give us something that we can write to or play to. Or... So uh, it's been nice. Uh, it's been kind of like taking things from very simple or like I said, I'll start with ACDC. I'll start with back and black at this tempo. And then as we progress, you know, open the hi-hats a bit more, maybe uh, make the kick pattern uh, a little more complicated, a little busier, adding in some fills, simple fills, now busier fills, now bigger, now quieter, now make it funky, now make it straight, you know. Uh, so that's been fun to kind of play around with each, you know, being given one specific BPM, but then w within the time that we're recording it, go through different... Uh, Style, I don't know if styles is the right term, but uh, different approaches to it, you know, and different flavors. Well, it's funny because I was saying, you know, yesterday, usually when I'm recording a song, you do it for three or four minutes, and then you take a break, and you listen, and you come back and do it again. You know, some of these that we've been doing just to get concentrated good work and ramp up to something interesting, sometimes we'll be doing it for 10, 12 minutes at once, and the up-tempo ones where, you know, my right arm was feeling at those eighth notes. I literally thought you were joking. I'm like, ha ha, because people say this stuff all the time in the studio. <laughs> oh yeah, something about the tape, you know, we're going to just change reels. And you're like, yeah, right, you know, because you're always on the computer. So yeah, you, someone said something about rewinding and I laughed. I said, very funny. And they said, no, we actually are we're rewinding tape. And I was happy to hear, and, and why not, you know? And, and the, I've worked with a lot of people that talk about wanting to use tape, but they just talk about it. And they talk up a big game, and sure, it sounds great, and you know, romantic notion to do it old school and do it analog. But the fact that we're doing it that way is, uh, I'm really happy, and people are going to tell the difference.
Vitrum Head is a still photograph from the 80s television show here in America called The Love Boat. I don't know the actor's name, but on the show his name was Isaac, he was the bartender. And the woman's name, the actress's name is Judy Landers, who was like kind of an 80s pinup, kind of played the bimbo role real well. And it's one of the most random, on rock and roll, confusing shots I could think of to put on my bass drum. I've, ne I've never had a personalized bass drum head, by the way. I've never had one that says my name. I've never had a Josh Ruiz on my bass drum head. And I've never had a band logo on my bass drum head. So I was like, okay, at age 42, maybe I should start taking, you know, still, still photos from old 80s television shows and put them on there. No, I mean, have fun with it. You know, hopefully we're giving everybody enough stuff uh, enough, enough good junk to uh, to play with and to to uh, you know chop into you know whatever music they're doing, a song they're writing, and you know and and I, I bet it sounds but a lot of stuff, a lot of sampling and stuff that people do, but the samples aren't that great. You can kind of in the end you tell and it sounds it, unless you're giving them beats to play with and stuff. Even if it sounds good, it end up it sounds programmed kind of at the end of the day. But I'm envisioning this stuff not sounding programmed. You know, and not sounding like samples because they're, you know, a step above, you know, the average ones. I think that I always kind of default right into rock and roll drumming, you know. Growing up, I've played different styles. I studied jazz and this and that, but I've really always played rock music. And I was, you know, people say to me, you know, God, you play all these different styles, you're multifaceted as far as that goes. And I always say it's always, it's kind of everything I do is under the pop umbrella, meaning there's different genres and subgenres of that, whether it's punk rock music or alternative music or singer songwriter stuff or heavy metal or pop. Uh, but it's all kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting called to do big band sessions or, you know, Latin jazz stuff. You know, it's all, it's all kind of rock and roll. Some of it's real quiet mellow. And some of it's fast and crazy and frantic, you know. Um, when we were putting up some of the clicks yesterday, I, like I said, I go right into rock and roll stuff, you know, for the most part. And, and a few times we got a little more uh, on the aggressive side of things. We talked today about doing some punk rock stuff, which I think would be great, too, because a lot of people, when they go to do uh, loop-type stuff, they just think... Uh, like loop s things they've heard. They want to hear funky. They right away they go like funky kind of loopy stuff. But I want to also be able to do some crazy rock and roll stuff where you wouldn't think in those terms necessarily, but give people a chance to to play with that stuff and make something out of it.